Okay. So welcome back, part three of the five pot uh, section. So uh, virtual handshakes to all, um, or is it still the elbow? Um, so, you know, we're still in our homes, uh, still going about it. Uh, we're doing well, still chatting about uh, exosomes. So uh, remember questions, questions in, as many as possible. And hopefully in the last session, we can get through them all. Or, you know, the other option is some things I've seen done is uh, we can take them to the side and respond, um, you know, at a, at a different time. That's, that's not a problem, whatever works. Because uh, we mentioned last time collaborations are key. So anything that we can do to help, or maybe we'll learn a few things. Um, so up to speed, let's get up to speed, right? So far, we've got you through the process of basically uh, figuring out what you want to do and how you should be doing it. So how to, what your samples are, what you're doing with them, do you want to label them, um, how they're being collected, when they're being collected, everything. What do they call it? Soup to nuts. Um, or is it soup to dessert? Whatever. So, and then uh, I said dessert because I love it. Um, so now back to then going to isolation and then how we can detect. And I was showing notes earlier. Uh, so, and, and our take home message is do not cry at this point. Um, you've made it this far. You're now on the, on the you know, get, get to the finish line parts. It'll so, be okay. Yes, it'll be okay. Um, I would that cry if you want. Sometimes they're tears of joy. Uh, you know, look, Alfonso's big smile. You know, some people, you know, may just be like, oh, he's so nice and tears of joy. So, <laughs> so now part three is going to be in our wheelhouse. Um, we're talking about flow cytometry, cytometry in general, because I don't want to forget about the microscopy part. Um, microscopy is dead. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> now they did imaging cytometry. We can't help ourselves. We find another good technology and we decide, you know what? We're just going to stop all over that too. Um, put our mark on it. So, so we're going to do a little bit of fun here. Um, Jen has been doing a great job paying our naive uh, flow cytometrist, um, pretending, oh my, I don't know any of this. And I'm going to caveat it by saying, if that was true, I have issues because she works in my lab. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, you would. <laughs> and there's a lot of people that may watch it that have worked with Jenner on exosomes and say, oh, what? <laughs> it's okay. Um, again, don't cry. So, I know a little more than I'm letting on. Yeah. So just, to, yeah, all of us know slightly more than we're letting on. Uh, let's go with that one. That's a good one. Um, all right, so let's talk about flow cytometers. Now, there are many different flavors. Um, you don't have to necessarily pick a favorite flavor. A lot of this is dictated simply by, hey, I want to do this. I'm going to the core. What instruments do they have? Um, you can want to do the greatest experiment of all time on the what you believe is the best instrument, but if your facility doesn't have it, then it's great. It's just a pipe dream. Um, you know, hopefully it's something that if it's that great, we can test it and get it in the future, but we go with what we have at the moment. Um, especially during these times, I don't think anybody's buying us new instruments. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, if so, you do feel free to contact us, uh, we'd love well, to talk to you. <laughs> well, how's it for you? Um, so we're going to talk, I guess, right about the Cytoflex today. Cause we have Alfonso who's in his lab practicing social distancing because, uh, it's My him. Name. <laughs> it's him and, and no one. Um, so you can't get more socially distant than that. Uh, we're practicing social distance because, uh, you know, he's across the pond. So I think that's. Uh, we're also in different one states. Or two yeah. Oh, yes. And Jenna and I are in different states. So there we go. Um, so that works. Um, look at that. We're pretty good at this. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of this stuff. We're, we're going to go. Okay, again, false world. Jenna has preached to her user who has done every single thing that has come out of Jenna's mouth that has been suggested by myself and Alfonso. Um, they have taken their samples in Jenna's suggestion and they have flown themselves across into Dublin. Um, <laughs> this is a nice vacation. Yes, and uh, they finally wandered out of the pub 
and are going to Ponzo's lab to, uh, to learn firsthand the tips and tricks that go along with the Cytoflex and how to uh, use flow cytometry in general, along with microscopy to give best possible results. Um, and I know that, and I keep saying the microscopy and, and like you'll have the NTA because they do go hand in hand. There's times when you come into uh, troubles with one of the techniques and so you wanna check it with the others. Uh, so that, you know, you know, am I just not seeing it today? Did something go wrong with my instrument? Um, so you want to be able to do that quality check. Otherwise, you know, you don't know if the samples are bad or the machines misbehaving that day. Um, so why I always say machines don't hate you. I do believe they have a personality. Some days they just don't want to be bothered. I find that Monday mornings, they take a little time to get going. And by Friday afternoon, they've already checked out for the weekend. Or it's the person between the chair and the keyboard. Not sure which one. Um, so Alfonso is going to take more of a lead role today. Uh, we'll ask him questions. Uh, I'll also um, would love to understand a little bit more on how he goes about doing it. So I'll learn a little bit today, too. Um, and obviously, because I can't shut up. I'm going to put lots of <laughs> input in. Um, yeah, it's either a curse or, 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 you know, a very beneficial thing that uh, I just spew. Uh, I have no filters and, ooh, we'll get to filters too. That was filters a good Filters are important. Yeah, yeah filters segue. are important. So we already know we need good sample. We need clean, uh, you know, sheath and everything else. So that's where we're going to start. So Alfonso, what is your trick? to getting the purest, best sheath you can find. <laughs> so uh, what, what I, I'm doing is um, we have the Cytoflex here. By the way, let me show you my little lab. We have here the Ooh. little toy, Cytoflex, Alex, it's here. Ooh. And oh. we have another instrument. In lab. The sorter there. Ooh, an escape room. <laughs> the, the weather <laughs> looks really nice over there. Yeah, and here and in the back, we have the proteomics facility there for antibody. Okay, uh, proteomics. If, you want, if you're in the flow, you want a microscope. We have one here. So. And you were saying we should be friends with the nano side. And we are. There you go. So one we have shop. We need here. So we are in Diego, too. All right. Um, um, with X, those are the bottles for the Cytoflex, um, and they are quite, quite clean. Uh, uh, filter water with 0 0.2 nanometer pore size. Um, what we have done is installing uh, in the millicule water at 0 0.04 uh, uh, pore size that will help us to have even cleaner, far cleaner uh, PBS. Of course, we are using as well some of the bacteriostatic to avoid the dirt. On, uh, any kind of bacteria, etc. Et so we want to make sure that the sheath is absolutely clean. We have no other things floating around. We were talking on the previous day about the swarming effect. If we have things floating around, they will also show up. So as clean as possible. And again, we were talking about uh, air bubbles. So we usually prepare them at least one day before. Um, so we have no air bubbles floating around that they they can scatter as well any any extra light. So that's that's a little trick. I would assume this is all so you can get the the lowest possible background noise. Yeah. So that's the, that's the idea to minimize the background as much as possible, and that's one of the things that um, I learned. It's not my idea. I have to say, <laughs> Dave McLean is the the one that um, I learned this this idea from. So. Definitely, I, I stole his idea. He shared some of the uh, references. And, uh, they were not selling here to, to Europe, so I have to find another vendor, adapters to put them on the, on the system. And we have a, one really nice guy here uh, fixing everything. So it was oh, nice. really useful. That's good. Yeah, I just know from, um, there's a few papers on setting up the Cytoflex for extracellular vesicle work. Um, and most of those go about assessing the background noise. So I assume that's something we're gonna be doing first. Um, yeah. Cause like you said, bubbles, uh, 
dirt in the sheath, dirt in the PBS or whatever HBSS plus plus, whatever else you're using, um, are all going to show up and cause more of a background noise. Um, so, so Jenna and everyone else, just to kind of give an idea, background noise, not necessarily the people clogging on top of Jenna's roof. Um, <laughs> not Sorry the guy, to hear that. Not the, not the people stumbling out of the pubs next to uh, Alfonso's lab, um, the on-campus pubs. Uh, noise in the sense of uh, instrument uh, type background stuff. So the cool part about the Cytoflex is that you have the APDs, right? And the APDs are chilled out, so they're a lot quieter. So we're talking about dock noise or shot noise um, from the actual detectors. So this gives off a certain signal. And you'll never ever encounter this. You will not have this problem uh, if you're not starting to play in the lower ends of your detector. So I have seen it. People have come in. We had a, a gentleman who uh, was very sure that his, his DS Red was was very positive and bright and all his colleagues doing the same work could not get the same result. Uh, so upon request, my, myself and, uh, and Bacillus, as mentioned previously, went and took a look. And uh, he had his PMT set down at about 225. <laughs> and so he was getting a lot of low end noise, which split <laughs> and gave him a negative and a positive. Um, so once that was adjusted, he was uh, happy to know how it worked, very disappointed <laughs> that everything he thought was working um, was absolutely junk. And so except for those instances, until you start playing with this very low end where you're opening the threshold to see everything, um, threshold discriminator, whatever you, you call it on your instrument, um, you don't realize they're there. And then all of a sudden you get this population that starts running at uh, what, 200,000 events per second. Um, you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> um, so, you mentioned specifically the AADPs. Uh, are you still able to use these on the older instruments with the PMTs? So APD is a specific. Sorry. How? I mean, maybe you can switch them. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of the newer thing, the avalanche photodiodes compared to the mm -hmm. photomultiplier tube. Um, or the avalanche diode photo. I'm not gonna. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's, you know, you call them whatever you want. Um, and so you basically have the ability to. Uh, pause. To pause and repeat. Um, yeah, I think she wants you to say APD. Yeah, APDs. I'm sorry about that. I <laughs> dyslexic slightly. So an acronym, sometimes I flip. It's all right. Um, okay. <laughs> Pat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could have so just said you, avalanche photodiode. I should have just if you guys, that. if you guys want to start from the question again, and then yep. avalanche photodiode. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Three. Sorry about that. Three, two. Um, so, if we were to look at the PMT difference between the avalanche photodiodes, can you still go back to the older ones and um, use those? Um. You have multiple options here. So yes, certain instruments now are built with avalanche photodiodes, um, the APDs. Uh, yes, we'll go back. Cytometrists love shortening everything. Um, we, we don't have the bandwidth to remember the entire things. Um, so the PMT uh, ha is a little less sensitive, a little more noisy, um, and has a kind of lower range um, of what you can output, right? Because it's voltage-based instead of gain-based. Um, so you can look up the whole physics of it, of the whole multiplying, you know, photons into electrons or avalanching them down, hence avalanche photodiode. And uh, I know they have more PMT type things too, now like silicon PMTs and things that have a lot more uh, sensitivity. So things are being developed constantly, but for bang for the buck in what we use, uh, is the avalanche photodiode getting so much sensitivity, so much lesser noise, um, and it works well. But we also have PMT based machines that we've been able to dial in too. So uh, you just, it's practice and, and error. Um, and you get the right settings and, and the, you know, you get your voltage. The sweet spot. Yeah, the sweet spots. A lot of it too has to do with laser power. So you stop playing with PMTs since you don't have the sensitivity you up your laser power, um, which again, cost, right? Uh, 
the nice little cytoflex that Alfonso is going to show us, it, it's, it keeps the cost down because it's using a, a more sensitive APD. It's using, you know, little diode lasers, you know, and all of this comes, makes things go down in, in, in cost. As you stop picking up power and bigger lasers and stuff, then you start spending some, some money. Um, so that's a good question though, because, you know, you don't want people to think, oh, I don't have an APD. I can't do extracellular vesicles. Yes, you can. We said, what's the limit of detection? figure that out and you just go from there. So, you know, it's like, again, we keep saying it's not one size fits all, right? You don't have to go out and buy a specific instrument. Some will help more than others. And it just depends on the aspect you're looking at. If you go into the fluorescent thresholds, which we talked about last session, it's not going to matter too much because yes, you want to be more sensitive, but just by doing and looking at things that are specifically labeled and bright, you can get around that problem. And Alfonso, I thought about it a little bit more. When you said, oh, what about the threshold with fluorescence? Do you lose stuff? Um, there's a lot written on the MESF values and back calculating to get um, out of arbitrary units into actual some sort of concentration or sizing. And so by putting different aspects together, you can start to tell the story a little more uh, clearly. Um, you're not just making things up or I would say peeing in the wind, but, <laughs> um, you know, you, you basically, you get a better aspect of what's going on. So, um, so we know, let's go through clean sheath fluid. Okay. As clean as possible. So if you can send it through a, I don't know if someone made a 0. 0.00005 <laughs> filter, go for it. Um, and then, no bubbles, so we want to degas, degassing. Um, I'm just trying to keep track here. And then no vortexing, because if you don't, what's the point of degassing if you're just going to put the bubbles back in? So uh, keep that setting off. Yes, keep that setting off. Um, how would you turn that setting off? Yeah. <laughs> if you have that option, turn it off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seems pretty easy. Oh. Pretty easy, it's on the software. So, yeah. oh, so it's not the OFF button. No, off the button. It's off. Oh, no, yeah. it makes anyway. <laughs> I thought it was an acronym. <laughs> all right, so we got all that. Now, how do we know? Oh, I'm not focused. Um, You're right. focused. Uh, you know, I'll focus. Um, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Typical John, can't focus. Um, <laughs> so the second part of that then is once we have all that, can we just run the QC and go? No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Trick so, question. More questions. Um, depending on what you have your instrument. In our cases, we are core facility. So we have the instrument. And unless you're in a rich lab, John, you might have some, some of these instruments fully dedicated to micro vesicle. Not my case. So here we have the, the instrument uh, ready to use for anyone with any kind of particle particles, cells, cells from anything, bacteria, etc. So the thing is, we will have a lot of proteins that they will be sticking into our flow cell. And we want to make sure that the tubings are absolutely clean. So what we do is we always ask any user that wants to do microvesicle to run deep cleaning for at least half an hour and afterwards uh, deep, uh, do some, some priming. That way, this is kind of when you're cooking. You cook a, a, a chicken and you put them and roast it, or um, turkey during the, this uh, fantastic day that you celebrate in US, okay? You finish with all of that, you are full. Now, will you clean directly your tray? You will not, because it will be quite hard to remove all that fat stick into your, into your tray, right? So what we do is we put some detergent on top and we leave it overnight with some water, hot water if possible, and following day, rinse of water, everything goes nice and easy. So that's exactly what we will do. We'll put the flow cell with a lot of this detergent inside, leave it half an hour, or following day, don't do it, <laughs> rinse on water, clean. So all the proteins are off. Now you have a far nicer and cleaner flow cell and all the tubing as well. So make sure that the tubes are absolutely clean. So, so you again, mentioned briefly, don't do it, leaving it overnight. Is that what happens to the flow cell if you do? 
um, you, you can corrode it. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so um, I, I, I don't want, I don't want to pay the bill. <laughs> so, <laughs> if some of the users, um, they do it, uh, and again, depending on, on the instrument that you have, depending on the detergent that you're using, the concentration of that detergent, some of these flow cells can be damaged. So I don't want to damage. So usually half an hour in this instrument, half an hour with the contract, uh, just leave it for half an hour, one hour, two hours. They will clean quite, quite nicely, okay? Uh, but usually I, I don't want to leave them overnight. They can burn uh, and then we'll have more effects. So um, make sure that you have a perfect clean instrument. Uh, and again, cleaning in between samples and, and we'll look at different controls. We want to make sure that we have no noise. So cleaning, 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 cleaning. You were mentioning, the, uh, John, the other day, about the tubes, we have a rack of tubes. Oh, yeah. We have a separate one, a rack of cleaning, 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 cleaning. So there are two things here, <laughs> control and clean. Clean, control. So um, You should do the same amount of cleaning in between each sample, right? Yes, no. <laughs> I usually say, do what I say, know what I do. So yeah, the recommendation, a lot of cleaning. If you talk to Andreas Splinter, he will tell you clean, 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 and he will spend the full day cleaning. Yep. There is a balance. Uh, at the end of the day, people need to run samples. They have to book the instruments. There is a queue on your back, and the people at the end, they, they run. So I will start with things that they are definitely not carry over into the next sample, so there is no labeling going from one tube into the other. So those tricks that in theory we should be perfect. I think, perfect. <laughs> in our personal experience, it's about establishing the baseline and getting back to the baseline. Yeah. So the easiest way to do that is if you set the baseline according to the uh, PBS, HBS, S++, whatever RPMI that you're using, um, and then run another tube of that in between the samples to see, okay, does it look the same? Yeah. Then you've given yourself, you know, kind of a, a, a starting point for each one so that comparisons can be made. Um, yeah, if you did a half hour cleaning in between every sample, um, I mean, it's great from a core perspective because you can charge someone for two samples like 24 hours. <laughs> um, but yes, there are certain things like, I think Alfonso bring the great point of you, you take your microscopy and you take a hundred pictures and you pick the best one. Same thing happens on a paper. So that day that you're getting the image for the paper out of your flow cytometry, you're, you're cleaning it. It's, it's beautiful. It's pristine. You, you acquire, you do all the wonderful things you can within your, whatever uh, analysis software you're going to use. And that's the one that goes off, you know, to, to be published. So, that's always the confusing fun part is people go, oh, I read this paper and how come it doesn't look like that? Because, because they ran it like a hundred times and they picked the one. <laughs> Optimization. Yeah. And again, make sure that you don't have any, any kind of carryovers, uh, especially on the, on the first controls when you want to make sure, and uh, we'll talk about these controls. You want to make sure that your antibodies, for instance, they are not stick together. Suddenly you have a cloud of, of proteins floating around. Uh, oh yeah, these are my EVs. No, those are your antibodies all together. But it's super bright. Yeah, all of them together make them super bright. So, so how do you avoid that? So what we recommend people is centrifuge, uh, centrifugation again, <laughs> spinning, remove uh, and get just the, the supernatal because you will have floating antibodies there. The, the ones that are stick together, they will be denser, they will be at the, at the end. Okay, so you just get the supernatal and that's the one that you will use. And you run one of those controls uh, through your sample. So you, you will see that the level of PBS, the level of your background is this. Your antibody is the same level. If you see some, suddenly something is spiking up, that's <laughs> a problem. So you have antibodies all together showing up because there's nothing else than your antibodies in, in your tubes. Okay. So that's the way we do it. Uh, John, you have another? No, that's... Pretty much what it is. That's one of the many controls is, is your solution along with your, your antibody. Um, yeah, people just centrifuge them and filter them. Um, you know, in the it's similar way. 
Yeah. And so, sorry, and same, same for the dyes, not just antibodies. You want yeah. to make sure that the, anti, the, the, the dye doesn't overstain. So mm. think of all the controls that you usually do on flow cytometry. Yeah. Um, you add more. <laughs> so I will say, since, since we're kind of skipping to that portion, I just will interject with that. There is, there is some means of doing it where you're not worried too much about the label. So if you have a membrane dye or you have a fluorescent protein or something like that, you got to remember you're dealing with fasciculation. It's part of the membrane. So the thought being is if you label the, the cells of interest, when they bleb, they'll carry the color with them. And yes, we have seen that that works. So I'm not just saying it, um, you know, ourselves ha have, have tried that, that method. Um, I, I believe Jennifer Jones has, has tried multiple labeling methods that have shown success. Um, and so you can actually do that. So it gets you around trying to figure out how much to use of the, of the labeling, um, which is the best and stuff. So you use the parent, you take the supernatant out of the dish, and you have some labeled EVs. So it's, a, it's kind of a nice go around, you know, um, as Ianitza likes to do. You put them all in, mix it up, <laughs> take out the supernatant and, and go. And so, you know, that, that's the, the very abridged easy version. So um, I know also you can do some nice uh, capture beads takes care of some of that problem. So if the bead itself captures uh, the exosome, then a lot of this becomes somewhat, you know, uh, a mute point if you can lay, put them on like a six micron bead, right? Uh, but like Alfonso said, it's a, it's a matter of loss uh, versus gain, right? What are you gaining versus what you're losing? So if you can look in the low aspects like he's going to do, then do it. If you can only see your limited detection is not so great, then obviously you have to find the methods that will allow you to do that, which could be the bigger beads or something along those lines. But um, yeah, so controls to set up the instrument. So we do the regular QC, right? So everybody just QC your, your machine um, and then clean again, because big beads can be a, a hindrance. And then, hmm. What can what are what are some controls you use to set up the uh, the the cytoflex in this this instance for uh, extracellular vesicle detection? So, um, I mean, beads are homogeneous. Uh, we can talk about refractive index again. Um, wish I had paid a little more attention to Dr. Dan Snowman, uh, my my physics professor. Yes, that was his name, Dan Snowman. Um, and so uh, I would have a better understanding of how refractive index and me theory affect all this. Uh, but that's for people like Edwin and, and, and Josh Wells to, to kind of comprehend, um, you know, uh, what do they say? Above my pay grade. <laughs> so uh, what do you use for controls, Alfonso? So uh, let, me, let me show you, let me share this screen for a second. Uh, I will show you. This is just pretending, okay? So if there's anything wrong, don't blame me, okay? <laughs> okay. Stupid machine. <laughs> I'm sharing now. There you go. So this is the first control I run. I want to make sure that the instrument is performing well. That's, that's the first thing. The laser has to be aligned. They have to be with the right power. So these are things that you can see here. It's working well. Everything is in green. Uh, the, the, top, the peaks are really tight, that they are matching the values of the fluorescence that we have as a reference standard. So that means that the instrument is, is performing absolutely well. In this case, if you see here, we, have, uh, in, uh, we are using a five laser. In, uh, the instrument has six, but this you see they can uh, do the analysis of five of the, of the lasers. So time delay is extremely important. If you are working in, in Ireland, that's okay. The weather is always the same, rainy, that's fine. But <laughs> if you go to Spain and we have fluctuations on the temperature in the morning, afternoon, etc., this is something I will definitely check because uh, the instrument has been QC in the morning. This is slightly changed on the temperature, the pressure, or uh, humidity, and things could change. So the first thing I will check is, is this one. You can see there, 
that have some red spots, uh, I want to see them. You as a core manager, you, you want to see red spots. Yeah. It would be nicer if I take them off and you say delete. I can do it. I don't want them and I don't allow my users to do it. I want to see if there's a problem to prevent any problems. And if there's something wrong on that particular day, I can come back and say, look, there was something wrong here and I can identify and reject those samples or these, these settings here, even if they fail, it's not affecting your sample. You're measuring in this laser, this laser, the one is failing in this one. So keep going, okay? Yeah. So uh, the first one I will go is through this QC. Um, to be honest, uh, it's super fast in, in this instrument. Some others might take a little bit longer. So you have some softwares that they are doing this QC for you. Some others you have to type in and write in and, and do the mathematical calculation afterwards. So in this case, we are lucky. It does everything for us really quickly. Okay. So this is the first control I, I will run. Um, now, what I will do is I will play a little bit with your brain because this instrument is slightly different. So I will close this QC and I will open a new experiment. In this case, it's just to show you a few things and a few tools that we will be using, okay? We have been talking about thresholds, okay? And remember, you have to train your, your own users. Wow, here, here I am. I'm not important now, focus on the screen. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what, what I will do is I'll create um, a new experiment. So I will say um, test uh, for John and Jan. John with cats, okay? So I'll do that. All right, so we don't want to cause bubbles. No. How would you do it? <laughs> so if you see here, I am generating now the air bubbles mm -hmm. and the Spanish uh -huh. baking. So this is something that you don't want to do, okay? So Have you ever just tried doing that? You can do that. Now, how efficient it is? Uh -huh. I don't know. It's, I, I do I'm that. Back. I've got the power flick. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts a lot. <laughs> I believe it's under um, 2 PSI of power. Um, <laughs> well, what I, I will do now is I have the sample. I place it in. These are the QC sample. Okay, I'll first initialize the instrument. Um, it's an energy saver. If I'm not doing anything, I'm just talking. It suddenly sleeps a little bit. So that's good. I place it in. I press run. So this is... Um, Funny thing, because people Should expect we get some graphs? to see all the graphs and everything. I don't care, <laughs> okay? I have the, the settings, I can start to record now. And um, knowing that I will have, because I have the default settings, it will be perfect in the right oh, way. Yeah, yeah. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, every, everyone that's seeing this is like, no, 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 you need to see the graphs and you play the voltage. We are uh, working uh, in a different area, okay? You already made Jenna nervous. We, we have now um, a big, it's like uh, when you have the TV, it used to be a TV like this. Uh -huh. the, now you have the plasma, you, you can see all of this, right? So you don't need to play too much with the voltage, okay? Now we recorded here 10,000 events, and you will see more or less everything is in the right place. Yeah, you're trying to prove a I just point start here. from scratch. So I will place uh, one graph here. So for instance, I will play with forward and side because you want to see your beats into the right spot. By default, this will be linear. There you go. You have them. I can zoom a little bit more, so you will see nicely how your beats are. Okay, so you can see your forward and side scatter. You can see different aggregates. I can select this group here. Perfect and nice. It's like magic. It's magic. You can zoom out. So we come back again to what we have in linear scale. I can put some of these graphs to see fluorescence in FITC or ECD or different uh, markers that I, I could be interested in. Some of them look like they're completely off scale. Well, if you remember, this is 10 to 6. This is a larger dynamic range. We'll be playing with these hands. I'm not recording and I'm not analyzing anything. I'm just playing with the data. So I'll bring this down. And it's on the scale, I do the same, on the scale, on the scale. Whoops, I move it too much. <laughs> <laughs> I move too much. So now here on the scale, 
and on the scale. Right? This, this aspect of remote cytometry is incredible. <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> Back in Whether the it's Dublin or, 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 or Columbia or uh, yeah, anywhere right. else. <laughs> now, I, now I'm on the other side. <laughs> yes. So you can see now it's everything nice and, and in, the right, in the right place. Now, what I want to show you now is a couple of things. Because this has been set up with a default setting. What you want to do is when you're working with very small particles, um, you want to go far below the side here. You are looking for something that is down here. So the first thing you need to do is change in the scale. You're working in linear scale, you have to zoom out. I cannot zoom out any more than this, yes, this is linear scale. So you need to change this and move into linear scale. So from linear, you change this to logarithmic scale. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now your beads are out there. These are around 2.5 microns. You're looking for something far smaller than that. But if you see here, there are a lot of things that you don't see. There's one point here that we are cutting the signal. That yep. you don't see anything below that. And definitely there are things below that. You have seen my air bubbles. These beads tend to break down, so you'll see portions of these beads, dust, and things like that. Okay, so we cannot see it because we have something called threshold. Okay, mm -hmm. so the threshold is something that we have access here. You can see that place is called threshold. So that's a tool that we'll be using to modify the actual thresholding. The actual threshold is something that we have here. You can see the channel is forward scatter. So at the moment, we are triggering by default in forward scatter. We are working with cells mostly of the time, so the instruments are designed to work with your cell, a big, big cell. Who cares about micro vesicles? Okay? And that's why by default, usually when you open this one, will be forward scatter area, side scatter area. We will be working with heights. Okay? So, okay. it is quite important. Um, we are changing from this to this. Yeah, because I, I know you read, we talked about reading literature and the literature for viruses, bacteria, everything, forward scatter doesn't get you much. Um, you know, that you have to go to some sort of uh, side scatter property. Uh, and so, especially in this, we've noticed in our, in our hands, the forward scatter really needs to be beefed up. <laughs> uh, it, it's, you know, not useful per se in this aspect of a threshold. Um, I know that for certain. Um, so we've, we've moved away from that and I'm sure you're gonna talk about that and, and how yeah, you move away from it. Yeah, it natural, you know. yeah so um, it's, it's very useful. Now what's, you have side scatter. So yeah. I have full scatter, I have side scatter. So I will do just a couple of things before we move into the violet side scatter that is something that, that um, John knows far more than me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, can give you, I can give you the me 101 um, or maybe it's even a hundred. I don't even know if we got the 101 class. Um, so what, what I will do now is Jenna, I will create a new tube. Okay. And you'll see a few things happen. So the first thing I'll do is I'll rerun the same sample. So I will press run and um, we'll still see the same samples with the same settings. What I want to do is change this. If you see now, my threshold is automatic. The machine automatically look at your sample, detects where we have mostly of the events and where the noise is coming and it blocks. Based on mathematical modeling, math don't ask me, okay? It's magic. You can find it in the literature. You can find it in the literature, okay? So what I will do is I change this and say, look, I don't want to do it automatic. I want to do it manually, okay? I want to change. The threshold on forward scatter, I want to place it here. Now, you can start to see more events. I'll make it bigger so you can see it a bit better. Uh, if I can. Is there a big, big button? <laughs> big, big button. So you can see now, let me increase the number of events to show. You can see here some events that you haven't seen before. Okay. I can go down even farther, I'll go down to here, and you'll see quite a lot of events coming up down here. 
and I can keep going down. And you'll start to see all that noise. Okay. Okay. The other thing that can, can you point out for us, Alfonso, how the uh, abort rate has just skyrocketed? Yeah, there are two things I'll show you. One is this, and the abort rate is 42%. Ah. Okay. Now, if I increase the threshold again, yeah. all that noise is gone. Number of aborts, 0%. So the other thing to mention on this, if, if, you, if you've used sorters, you understand the abort rate. If you've never used a sorter or a cytoflex, abort rate in your analysis may be something completely new to you. Um, it's one of the first I've encountered that actually puts up the abort percentage. Uh, and it's basically the, it's the instruments just not having a good time trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and it, very simply, like he said, there's a, there's a physicist that's in the machine and he's doing all these algorithms very quickly. Um, and I think he's got a big chalkboard or maybe a whiteboard. Um, and the problem is he can't keep up. So he can't do the equation and erase fast enough <laughs> for the next thing. So as the events just come pouring through, uh, you, you can't put them where they need to be. So instead of making a mistake, you know, he, this, this physicist in the machine is very, very, wants to be very accurate. He just throws them out. It's just easier to get rid of them than to set, than to make a mistake. He doesn't, he wants to be perfect. So uh, that's a big thing to look into. The other thing is the height. So we're using height because in most instruments, the height is actually uh, used as the parameter. It's actually measured. Um, whereas area is back calculated from the height. Obviously, how do you calculate area? You need the height. <laughs> so uh, this is why it's a little more accurate. You get a little less uh, issues going on there. But uh, it, I guess too is that if you just try it out, you see for yourself, right? So a lot of it is just, you know, instead of taking our word for it, but like we said, we want to keep it so that you can make less mistakes and get right to the, the science portion. So, Is there a recommended abort rate that you guys would say to stay within? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe the recommendations are to stay below five. Yep. Um, and so that gives you the most, act you got to remember, you're trying to get data on a linear plan. So I was, I was joking about they throw out the stuff they can't figure out. Well, it's outliers, right? It's outliers to that linear linearity of the instrument. Um, so if you start going too fast, I think the Cytoflex it, it le doesn't mind anything 10,000 events or lower. Um, you start getting above that, the linearity goes sideways, and it's just easier to abort these problems. Um, so keeping that events per second down, everything below 5%, and you can do that for yourself, or you can just read some papers that have done it. So I, like you said, I think Andreas, uh, Splita has has done it. Um, George Britton has some th some papers. Um, I'm trying to think, I know we've done it. Uh, so there's literature out there that you can find on setting up the instrument using violet side scatter detection, and all those things are mentioned with the rates. The other thing the abort rate will show you is if you have dirty stuff. So if you're running your PBS and your abort rate, like he said, it's zero, and then you just put in, you know something that you oh i i got my antibody here with pbs and then all of a sudden you got a ton of events and aborts and stuff well you probably have some antibody clusters he talked about you could have just some contamination you know yeah uh, lick the tube, <laughs> no, don't <laughs> then, the tube. <laughs> no exosomes are everywhere so you could spit in the tube and get yourself some wonderful results <laughs> i don't suggest going to your lab and spitting in tubes but um and i said do not cry oh but if you do Collect them. <laughs> yeah. uh, so should you keep your sample flow rate on the lower side then to also help counteract the uh, abort noise? I'll show you that trick as well. Oh, Don't that trick's coming up. Okay, <laughs> I'll, coming. I'll jump it ahead. <laughs> yeah. So um, first thing um, you see here, I have the threshold. I will drop it down again and look what is happening here. Uh, you can nicely see the signal of, of your beads uh, but as soon as I'm starting to increase my threshold, because there's so much noise, you'll start to see, by dropping this down, suddenly you don't see the signal. 
you lose it. That signal that we used to see there is gone. It's quite difficult to see it and identify. And now you can see that peak there. Okay. <laughs> so playing with the threshold first will drop down your, your number of awards, will help us as well to focus into our, our actual signal. Okay, so we have to play a little bit on a balance to show this is a noise, fine, fair enough. Yeah. This is my full population, great, but this is finishing here. Okay. So do you recommend having uh, always just a little bit of noise present to show that you found a threshold area? I, I really like to see some, some noise as well because you have to show this is my baseline of noise. Okay, we usually will be perfect not to see anything, but we have the noise and it's, it's good to show up to here is noise from here up is, is my sample. And we have been talking about the, the background noise of the sheath and make sure that we have no interference with the antibodies coming up as well and showing up. So we need to show that there's some noise and where the noise is coming from, okay? As long as you, you have it controlled. Okay. The other thing that is important here is, um, John was mentioning the side scatter. So we will see again that we have the forward scatter threshold here. We can right click and say, we want to use now side scatter. We can use the side scatter, in fact, the side scatter threshold is one of the ones that we use for bacteria. So the result at the end is the same. And again, we can start to play and drop down the side scatter threshold as long as we want. Okay. So this is another option. What we can do as well as threshold, combining forward scatter or side scatter or forward scatter and side scatter. So we can say and. Okay, forward scatter and side scatter. Oops, sorry. And I want to remove all this noise. Or I can combine this threshold with forward scatter or side scatter. So you can see where the noise is coming in one place or the other. Okay, so you can put your, your limits. We were talking as well about um, fluorescence because you and this was a discussion point. Will you trigger based on my target um, EVs? They, are, um, they have CD9 for sure. Okay, so we can put the labeling and focus just on your CD9 positive microvesicles or EVs. Okay, so what about this one here? If they are positive and we label them with this one, we can place the threshold now on fluorescence. Now you can see the noise, you can see your beads, but also you can see your beads on the fluorescence. I can play as well with my fluorescence in here. Okay. So again, you can play with one or the other. What if I want both of them at the same time? So you just play this beside seven, and I will play with my threshold in fluorescence, side scatter, fluorescence and side scatter, fluorescence or side scatter. So I will place this one and I want this one down here. So imagine that you're looking for some particles that they are not CD9. They will show up there. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, it's a good way to play with different scatters or different thresholding to identify your samples. John? Yeah, I mean, this is what we were talking about previously where I said I like to look at everything with the fluorescence, also the, depending on what the sample they give me is. And, you know, I know speaking with you, we've, we've been trying all these different thresholds and combinations and just to get a clearer picture, like you said, it's, it tells us which ones have actually labeled correctly and then what are the ones we may have that separate out of the noise? So you get a more clear picture. Um, I, I play devil's advocate. How much noise do you like to leave in? Um, I know from my experience in working with Jennifer Jones in the paper um, that she put on in the sorting aspects is using some of the noises as a control. Um, because once you've set the thresholds, the noise should stay pretty consistent in its positioning. Um, obviously, like you said, signals, the more signal you have, the less noise will be there. The more noise you have, the less signal. 
So if you have a ton of fluorescent particles, then your noise tends to have less of a percentage, but it's still in the exact same place. Do you like to eliminate all the noise or do you leave a little bit to show that you're not hiding something behind the curtain? Let me explain you another thing here that I really like. So that, that could help. Um, I want to see some noise. I definitely want to see some noise because I, I don't know where I need to stop. And sometimes the surprise is just a little bit above the, the noise. As you said, we have limits. We are playing at the limit of the detection. So sometimes there's some population pulling out just at the limit of the detection. So mm -hmm. That's really good to see. Okay, so I'll go as, as low as I can, or as low as this little toy allows me to go. <laughs> okay, and again, depends on, on your sample preparation, um, my theory uh, and the scattering properties of your samples. We are not talking about size, we are talking about the scatter and the population that we, we can see. Okay, so um, I always want to see a little bit of noise. Uh, uh, that's, that's my opinion. I want to see the noise to see what else is coming and where is my limit, okay? The other thing you asked me is about the speed. So you can see at the moment we are in an average rate of 11. So if I increase to medium flow rate, I'm going faster. I'm going faster again. And one of the things you will notice is first, what is happening with this peak here? Have a look. Let's go back to slow. And I restart. Look at your peak. If I go too fast. So increasing the speed can increase the CV results, which leads to thicker peaks. CV. Yeah. And we were talking about the swarming effect. So basically what you're doing is you have these core sites and then you have the sheet mm -hmm. surrounding them. So when you increase your flow rate, it's not that you're running your sample faster, it's that you're running more volume of your sample. Okay? So instead of having a particular cell right in the middle of your core string and everything aligned and the laser is coming, you increase your flow rate, you increase your volume, you have more particles floating around. And I'm talking about cells. Now imagine all these particles floating around at high speed or trying to be aligned in that flow rate. So as slow as the slower I can go. But if I put this floating around here, imagine the swarming effect that you're generating. If I can see this effect in 2.5 microns, imagine the same effect now in microvesicles or EVs, okay? So you have a cloud of them floating around, okay? So it's really important not just to look at the, at the abort, it's also look at what's the effect when you're changing this. And this is something we'll play as well on the controls and we'll dilute and see how it is affecting as well. <clears throat> One, coefficient of variation. <clears throat> and the other thing you have seen is that it's dropping down on the fluorescence, so the medium fluorescence intensity will also change. So we don't want to go too low, we don't want to go too high, we want the perfect um, dilution. Goldilocks, okay. just right. Yes, it's a, uh, we want to make sure that our, we enhance our dynamic range and keep our signal to noise ratio as best as possible. Um, by making everything wider, you limit that dynamic range, right? As Alfonso was pointing out, so it's, uh, it is tricky because it was a great example because what happened was we increased the events per second, but you could make the argument, oh, look, my abort percentage was below the five. Isn't that what I wanted? Um, well, at what cost? So everything is, is how much are you willing to sacrifice on one end to get something on the other end? Um, and so it's about not being perfect, but being uh, best. Um, what is best to run the samples? Because remember, like you said, 2.3 micron beads, uh, you know, we can do that all day long. Um, <laughs> any machine can be the best bead acquisition machine ever um, or the best bead sorter, whatever you want to go with. But, you know, here, 
you want to be able to get down and then what's going to happen. And like uh, Alfonso said, it's going to be like after this, this coronavirus, when they give the all clear, it's going to be like opening a giant gate and watching people just run out, right? It's going to be, everything's going to be just packed up and, and all these things when it's the all clear. Um, we're trying to make it more like the, uh, how they're doing these rollouts, right? A little bit at a time. We want to just have these little guys going on a little bit at a time and not contaminating or causing problems everywhere. So, uh, you know, I tried to make that analogy. So it's with the current times. Um, but yes. And remember, especially not even just these big beads, but all the beads we're talking about, they're beads. Beads behave <laughs> uh, for the most part. So cells are a little bit different. So. The other thing I want to I want to show you and explain you is how many events do you want to record, okay? And how, for how long? So ten thousand, yeah, ten thousand events if you're working with sales, okay? Because as long as you say ten thousand, and you look at your statistics here, if I say ten thousand, only four percent of those ones are my beats. So I'm analyzing. 494, um, 494 particles. Is that good for you, for your statistics? No, because you have recorded 10,000 events. Oh yeah, but I have 10,000 events, but yeah, but useless, <laughs> because I just want the 4,000, okay? I want 4,000 for doing some statistics with that population, okay? So how many events? Um, what I usually recommend to my users is two minutes. And it doesn't matter which one is your target, which one is your number of background. If the instrument can handle a large amount of particles, go for two minutes, record as much as you can. Because again, we're looking at things that we have no clue. So the difference between one patient and a normal per uh, and one uh, person without the disease could be a rare population. One rare population of EVs that is appearing or disappearing. So only by recording a huge number of events, we'll see it. And it's also giving us some stability analysis. So we can see that it's not a spike. It's not a problem with the fluidics. We have analyzed everything in the perfect timing. So time is, again, a very important key here. Yeah, so we're, we're going to have to... Sorry. Go ahead, John. Uh, Go ahead. So we're... We're going to have to have something that can uh, house large data files then to be able to analyze this further. My computer is good enough. <laughs> yeah. Just you have to be a little bit patient, but it's good enough. Uh, but even in my laptop, I can analyze uh, these files you know, with no problems. Yeah, it's, it's not too bad. They don't, imaging. Yeah, they don't get huge. Um, I, I like the two minutes because we've done it. Uh, in different faction, fractions, uh, we've done like a million events and stuff like that. I found the time works well because like you said, when you're comparing patient samples, it also gives you that idea that, okay, you're doing the same amount of time. You get a relative idea of how many uh, EVs that individual has also. It's not like you're just getting to a number and then everybody's at the same number where maybe this 4% is, you know, 4.9% is relevant in the fact that you run the next guy, patient and they're at, you know, in two minutes, instead of running 494 events, they ran, you know, 4,940 events. And so that tells you, okay, there's more in that particular sample. And that also was kind of like saying, well, look, you can also calculate events per microliter <laughs> because you're doing relative counts here. Um, we used to do it using uh, bead spikes. So you put a bead in with known concentration that was larger than what you expected, say like, even, you know, 500 uh, nanometers. And then basically you could see, okay, they show up in the same spot. It was a good internal control. So, uh, you know, there's multiple ways to get to the same place, but I agree 100% that after doing all this, timing seemed to be uh, the best methodology for us. Because you can also cut off the beginning portions where you tend to get these boost peaks and valleys. Uh, if you're cutting off the beginning portion, should you add to your protocol a wait time before you hit this record? No, because the minute and a half is good enough. But who knows? 
I mean, you could get that in the middle where you get a weird turn of the peristaltic pump. Um, that's why Alfonso was, was saying time becomes this, this huge parameter in these things, um, yeah. which we may have to touch base more in the, in the next section um, on those things. Because, uh, you know, setting up the machine is not as, not as quick and easy as one would say, especially when you're trying to walk someone through it. <laughs> one of the things I want to show here is so, because he mentioned, um, John mentioned um, about the number of leads per microliter. This is, uh, in this case, because it's a very starting instrument, has full control of the volume as long as it's calibrated. So you can know how many particles you have per microliter. And if you know your dilution, this is a value that you can add on. Not just the total, if you, if you look at the nanosite, it will tell you the total amount of microvesic or EVs that you have on your sample. Uh, in, in this case here, we can tell you exactly how many EVs you have in one particular subpopulation. And how is this varying yeah. with uh, different, different samples, different patients, okay? So you can have exactly the same population with the same concentration. It's a teeny tiny, but compared to the others, the other ones are the ones growing up. Not this one is growing up, it's the other one. But diluting is the other one. So you have the control, how many? Uh, do we lose them? So the thing we were talking is how much sample we are spending how much sample we are spending on on uh, because i want to do western blotting and microscopy and nano tracking okay so um here we will record and i will tell you for one minute how much volume we will record uh, always is here already i know the volume <laughs> i will press run and i will record because i want to make a comparison with another set of beads that we have here okay Presenting that we are working with two different uh, models. So I will record now this, and this will give me 10,000 events. That's what we have here, events to record. But now we'll change this. I don't care how many events we have to record. So I will take this off into the next. I don't care about those ones. What I care is I want to analyze this for 60 seconds. And I want to analyze this on a volume record, or I don't care about the volume, but you might be really low on the volume, so you don't want to suck air, because air is coming again. So if you have one sample that you have no control on the volume, and you're talking to your friend, happens, now know with the distance, okay, well, you can be what's happened, but <laughs> suddenly you run out of the sample, air is coming in, and you have to degas as well the instrument. Okay, get ready for that. <laughs> okay, so you can stop as well based on volume. So let's say we'll place in the same side 100 microliters. Okay, have enough over there. So I will press run and I will record my sample. Okay, and then I will, I will compare this one, my sample number one with my sample number two. Okay, so I'm recording now. Suddenly, you can see that in my target population, the percentage is still the same, but now I'm working with 3,000 events. So now I'm getting robust in my statistics on one side. On the other side, if I look at my, my signal on time, you will see I'm on the stable side and I can remove cloggings or problems with the fluidics, the stability on the fluidics, okay? So this population here, it's constant and it's there. This population here is constant and it's there. This population here is constant and it's there. Okay, so there's nothing showing up absolutely new. Let's wait for a second. Uh, well, not for a second. In fact, we have to wait for um, five, four, three, <laughs> two, one, and stop in one minute. Okay, so percentage wise is the same. But now we know how many events we have, and it's for statistics is correct. The distribution hasn't changed. In fact, has made everything far smoother than if we compare to the previous one. Then you can see more flicky things. Okay, so mm -hmm. we don't need to use the smoothing in the software. We can use it by increasing the number of events. Okay, 
The other thing is how much volume I spend. So I can go to my statistics app and ask, oops, sorry. Statistics tab is here. And I can go to settings and ask how much volume I have spent on this analysis. Okay. I will ask this to all my tubes. And you can see we have spent 10 microliters, which is exactly what is telling me here. Sample flow rate, 10 microliters per minute. Okay, so you only spend 10 microliters of your sample. As John has been indicating, we are diluting yes. your sample. So how much volume do you need from your sample to start with flow? Well, all this now, you're showing all the secrets. It's less magical. Um, <laughs> it's not the magic box you put stuff right. in. <laughs> um, I just want to mention a couple of things like, yes, this is great setting up and this and that. And then... We'll get a little more into controls, but you want to make sure, you know, everybody, there's bead sets, right? There's lots of bead sets um, that you can use. Most companies sell some form of controls for, uh, you know, nano flow cytometry, whether they call them micro beads or nano beads. Uh, they come with fluorescence without, they come in silica, uh, polystyrene. I believe uh, some people are trying like hollow spheres. Uh, so you have lots of options. Again, it's just about consistency. So if you get something, use that. Um, a lot of them come with software packages like Rosetta. Um, I know we work with Josh Welsh doing the NIST traceable beads and some uh, me type scattering uh, calculations to get kind of a, you know, a quantitative curve so that you can, like I said before, you want to be able to change arbitrary units into something that is, you know, useful for for people or understandable so that you can give them a concentration as we're doing here a size instead of just relative to things um and then there's lots of yeah <laughs> some uh some apogee type beads um with multiple peaks and, and things like that um i just create my own because like i said the mist they come like milk and you dilute them so i create my own curve uh, of sizes um just because I have them. Um, I bought them, I have them, there you go. Uh, I just mix them together. Any of these are kind of acceptable uh, type methods of just, it's more of a quality assurance of the machine. If you're actually looking for something to compare size to, you either have to do a modeling with one of the softwares available or biological controls. Um, I know John Nolan in his talk last week gave some of the things that he's using with like um, lipoproteins uh, platelet EVs, red blood cell EVs, uh, which is back to our topic, red blood cell EVs, and how awesome they are for even creating EV populations of, of kind of a known size so that you can use them on your machine. Uh, and you can do that simply by using an optimization step for your red blood cells, or we do complement rings uh, to generate uh, EVs to make them very to the biological system, right? It's what we do uh in internally and uh there's lots and lots of control <laughs> possibilities viruses uh, yeah so the viruses i know there uh, you can get mouse leukemia viruses um that are viruses are great because they're they're very well characterized um so you know their structure you know their size you know everything about them um, we use uh, an HIV sample that we get from a gentleman at MIT. Um, non-infectious. Non-infectious. So he strips the, the capsid. Um, so it makes them 92 nanometers. Um, and then he adds a GFP or another fluorescent protein to them for us. Uh, so we have them with and without. And then the most common one that you can use too that I'm sure most labs have or like an EBV. Um, so if you can find someone with mononucleosis, just take their blood and culture it for years to come. Um, I don't suggest infecting someone with it just to get samples. Yeah. No, it doesn't comply to your IRB, but uh, technical difficulties, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, most labs, if you, if you have a virology lab next to you, you can get these things, you know, or you can get them commercially. Uh, and you add, the, you have the added benefit of the people that are doing commercially are doing the quality control for you. Um, 
you know, you're not worried that, you know, Tom across the hall uh, let his <laughs> virus cultures just run wild. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, here you go. I think this one is <laughs> an HIV, probably not infectious. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I also know I suggest because when we started getting these, we get them from Ianitsa. And he made that huge mistake of announcing to a room full of people, oh, yeah, if you need it, I have HIV. <laughs> <laughs> or I have EBV. You want to stay away from those comments, uh, they, you know, especially in this COVID-19 time. You don't want to tell anybody you have viruses. Um, yeah, so. You have calibration particles. You have biological calibration particles. Um, I believe that's what we call them when we first started using them. So we didn't scare anybody. Um, we, they said, how do you calibrate? And we said, we have biological calibration uh, particles that we'll be using that are labeled with a known quantity of GFP. Oh, that's the added benefit of those mouse leukemia viruses um, or the stuff that John Nolan has is that you can add um, GFPs or, or like a uh, DSRED or some derivative to them also in known quantities. I think the MLBs come with a superfolded eGFP and I know John has membrane dyes that attach to the EVs that um, he generates. So, uh, okay, so. Let me run one sample quickly. I'm gonna run one sample yeah. so we can wrap this session up. And then we wrap this session? Yeah, because so we don't want to bore you. Run to, one to, to show you the difference. Yes. And, and I will ask the question that we'll open for the next one, okay? So I'll just run. So first thing, um, these beads tend to be quite sticky and that's why I want to wash them away. Okay, so I expect to see, there you go. The first thing I want to see is this, okay? I want to see that problem on that side, okay? I want to see that stickiness into my sample and that's a carryover, okay? So you yeah. have to make sure that we don't have any, any carryover from one side to another. But now is the difference. Can you see the difference? Oh, oh look. Not, Beautiful population. Okay, I can record now and start to see my population, where should there be anything? So even if I have that carryover, there's a difference, mm -hmm. okay? Even if we have a mistake, and I repeat that mistake again and again and again, I can see the difference between my sample A and my sample B, okay? Uh, these are those calibration beads that uh, he was mentioning, some of these ones that there, we know that we should have far more populations here, that means my side scatter is too low. Look how bad is the resolution of the forward scatter, as uh, John has mentioned. Forward scatter is no good to resolve these different sizes. And what you can see nicely here, the separation on these particles. If I want to see more populations, I can go and increase my gains. But now I'm recording, so I cannot do it. I will stop it, and I will play with the gain. Okay, this is another advantage on this instrument. It's not like the previous um, ACQUI that you have a voltage set and there's nothing you can do. In this case, you can fine tune a little bit more by increasing your gain, okay? So- You should keep everything run at uh, relatively the same game though for the sample set. Oh yeah, once you have your control set. Once it's, once it's set up, you should <laughs> yeah. run all so we'll do in the that setup. set. Yeah. All right. so. So I'm gonna wrap this section, but I wanna point out some things that, that Alfonso has made very clear for us, is one, Jenner had asked about uh, cleaning the system. Well, that, just putting on a PBS and seeing those beads would allow you to understand what you need to do to clean up, right? So you start a protocol of how to clean that out. Um, secondarily is things that are out of the way. We said you could use that just as a uh, control, so if you added a little bit of a large bead in that you could see, you could use that knowing that it's gonna show up in the same spot every time to make sure that things have not fluctuated between samples. Um, a third point that I like is he said, you can start to play with things. It gives you lots of freedom. Um, I'm a tinkerer, right? Uh, I like to touch, I like to get in and move things around. I like whether it's software or hardware. So. That is incredible. And the reason I say hardware is because at some point we are gonna talk about this wonderful thing called violet side scatter and how easy it is to transition over to that and get 
uh, a better separation and more dynamic range without sacrificing any of that noise floor. You're not adding anything else. If anything, it's getting a little bit better when you stop playing with different scatters um, that you have available to you. So uh, I know this was maybe a little bit longer because we're starting to get into the uh, nuts and bolts and starting to play around with the instrument, which if you've ever gone through an instrument training, you know is not always straightforward and quick. Um, you know, it, it takes a little bit. Sometimes you have some hiccups and you got to do this or that. Um, but I was so happy that we got to show the instruments. Uh, I, I believe I'll be in my lab on the next session to do even more um, so we can share both. Uh, let's see. We have two more sessions. Hopefully we can get through them nice and peacefully and get you all the information that's needed. Uh, we Questions? Welcome. Please give more questions. Uh, we're going to have those to answer and hopefully that'll clear up some of the things that are slipping our minds or that we get into these, these side digressions um, and forget about. So uh, I hope you enjoy it again. And I, I'm going to keep ending with the, uh, you know, keep your distance, stay safe, um, and hope you're enjoying as much as I am. I want to. <laughs>